open. Good, we get some fresh air. Uh, I'm Andrew Shapiro. I'm the founder and president of Green Order, a strategy and management consulting firm that's been working for a decade to help companies turn environmental innovation into competitive advantage. Uh, I've also been involved with the Aspen Institute for a dozen years as a seminar creator and moderator and a program director, and so it's great to be back here as always. I've actually spent a lot of time in this very room. And we have a terrific panel today on the topic of measuring sustainability, yardsticks for success, a topic which, as you will see shortly, contains multitudes because it's not just about measurement. It's about coming to consensus on what we measure, how we measure, why we measure. And to assist us, we have four terrific participants and panelists. And then I'm really eager to make sure that we have ample time for many of you in the room who are experts in this subject to join our dialogue. Uh, so starting on my right here, we have Nancy Tor who is a senior executive at CH2M Hill uh, and is the executive sponsor of all of their sustainability work. So is well uh, qualified to address this question, both from the business perspective and more broadly. Uh, next, we have Jacob Shear, who is a senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council and has been a veteran in the non-governmental organization world. We then have Mike Robinson, Mike is with General Motors and has been there for a number of years and is uh, okay, responsible for all the policy and activity related to energy and environment at GM. And we have Matis Wackernagel from an organization who you will see uh, a document here, their ecological footprint. This is the Global Footprint Network's document and we're going to get into some of their work shortly. Let me just take a moment to frame the conversation. And uh, my panelists, my co-panelists and I have had a little bit of a chance to talk about this. And um, we want to talk about the various tools that are available to governments, to civil society, to businesses, to assist in measuring sustainability, environmental impact, natural resource impact. But we also believe that it's critical to step back and perhaps go up a level and to think about why we focus on measurement. Uh, we don't want to just do, I don't think, measurement for measurement's sake. We want measurement to be a tool in the effort to build progress toward a more sustainable world. And so maybe the first underlying question is, um, why do we measure? And then what do we measure? And one could include all sorts of different environmental criteria from carbon and energy to natural resources to water to biodiversity, human health, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we need to really develop consensus on these issues to be able to measure effectively. Because if one country uh, is measuring something in one way, in another country in another way, one company in a certain way, in another company in another way, we're going to get lots of measurement but not a lot of knowledge or intelligence or insight. In the business context, which is where I spend most of my time, uh, measurement is absolutely critical. And so one of the first things that we discuss with senior leadership teams of companies is if you can't measure your progress around sustainability, it's almost not worth doing. You know, there's an adage in the business world that what gets measured gets managed. And conversely, what doesn't get measured isn't managed and it's basically left by the wayside. But the measurement needs to be preceded by very clear and very meaningful goal setting. And so on a panel that's about measurement, I want to make sure that we take ample time to really talk about how do we as businesses, as communities, as countries, and as a world undertake ambitious, clear goal setting. Uh, that will ultimately then be measured by the kinds of tools we're talking about. So uh, that goal setting can include things that we'd all be familiar with, like let's reduce our CO2 emissions by X percent by year Y. But it can also include things that are more qualitative. Let's innovate 
around clean technology more so that we can come up with propulsion systems that don't require petroleum? How do we measure success and progress on those kinds of things? So we need to figure out both the goals and the means of measurement that will ultimately lead to the transformation that we want to see happen in society, uh, and some of which uh, will be harder to measure. So how can I know when my company uh, has evolved in terms of not just uh, you know, taking the easy steps, but actually changing mindsets and changing how people think? Is that something that we can measure? Um, so these are some of the thoughts that I come into this panel with. And to start us off, I am going to ask Matis Walkernagel um, to share first some high-level thoughts about efforts to measure and footprint tools, and in particular, uh, the, the methodology that he and his organization have developed. And then we will go from there. Thank you, Andrew. It's wonderful to see you all. This is really the core group for sustainability because as you say, if we don't measure, we don't really take it seriously. Now, my intention is to give you a sense of possibility. That's when I would call success, when you move out of this room and afterwards think, wow, we really can turn nations and companies around. Uh, and, that, and that's my belief. Uh, my belief is that nations, cities, and also some companies don't fully understand their self-interest and that there's much more opportunity to move towards sustainability than we all believe. But I think measurements are critical to see that gap between what's in our interest and where we are right now. Now, the good news, I think, to start with is that everybody wants sustainability. And right now in Geneva for the summer, and so, for example, if you ask people from WTO, what do you want? They will say, we want free trade. And then you say, well, I mean, that's a, that's a strategy, but why do you want that? They say, oh, we want that because that's good for economic growth. Say, yeah, that's an interesting strategy, but why do you want that? And then they say, because we want people to have good lives everywhere. Say, ah, you want sustainability. So you can have this conversation with anybody. Sustainability is really deeply what everybody wants. But we have different beliefs about what gets us there. And I think that's where measurements come in, because measurements codify our beliefs. And so if you have a belief that it's through GDP that we get to that place, we manage GDP and we get GDP. So I would like to just explain the perspective from the perspective of three professional views. The pilot, the farmer, and then the gambler. Uh, and, and, to, and I mean gambling, I brought a hundred dollar bill that you can win, perhaps. I put it here. Ah. Oh my God. Uh, and, and so the, the, this the, is the, not your typical Aspen <laughs> seminar. <laughs> It's and, so far a country music song with yeah. a gambling thing at the end. That's That's right. yeah. And, and so, so what's the pilot's perspective? Essentially, I think an economy or a company is very similar to an airplane. And the question is, what do you need to have on your dashboard? What do you need to know in order to operate your plane safely? So that's the driver. And for, an, for, for a nation in the rapids of the 21st century, I would say, while resource constraints were not that severe in the last century, we need to understand resource constraints in the 21st century, otherwise you cannot operate. And you may not need to know it exactly, for example, the fuel gauge in my car, I can f get much further on the first half of the gauge than the second half because the gauge is somehow not very well done, but nevertheless it gives me an indication, am I close to empty or not close to empty? So we may not have to have the most precise, not precise instruments, but we have to have the relevant instruments. And I think not to have the gauge on how much fuel is left in the plane is dangerous. And that's where we are today, that we don't understand how much we have left and how much we use. Which brings me to the farmer, because I think farmers, they make great contributions, obviously, to us because we have great food. But even more so, I think, if they offered their thinking more freely and helped us see the world more from a farmer's perspective, we'd be much better off. And that's what we're trying to do with the ecological footprint, very simply saying, essentially, we need to understand nation by nation or city by city or whatever unit, how big is our farm? Is our farm big enough to support us or are we just a hobby farm? Hobby farms are nice, but you need some other income to buy your tomatoes from other places. And so you can then determine from a farming perspective how much capacity you have, that's what we call biocapacity, and how much do we use. And when you look at the map that is on this little leaflet, you can see the results for the world today. This map was virtually green 
uh, when I was born. Today, most countries are in the red, meaning they use more ecological resources than what they have available within their own ecosystems. Uh, and that is becoming the context, I believe, for the 21st century, because these ecological deficits are becoming a risk. We believe if countries don't manage for this ecological deficit, as they manage now for unemployment, they will be in a very dangerous situation. And so that brings me then to the last point of the gambler perspective of saying, I believe I believe actually that sustainable development in the end is the most specific, the most specific policy idea that is around. People talk about progress, you know, how do we measure progress? But actually sustainable development is quite measurable if we want to, because it has two components, as the word say, sustainable development. So we have development as a short cut for saying we want to have great lives. And we can measure that in many ways. The United Nations uses the Human Development Index as a summary, for saying we want to have long lives, we want to have access to education, we want to have some access to income. So we want to be high on the HDI, and the Human Development Index over 0 0.8 is considered to be high development. So we want to be on the right of the vertical line. But at the same time, we don't say accelerated development, we say sustainable development because there's only one planet. So the question is, what's the resource availability globally that we have? And that's about four acres per person or two hectares. Uh, in 61, we had about double as much because we were about half as many people. And uh, so we can measure country by country, person by person, where are you on this scale? And what we will find is then that, and that's where the gamble begins, where the challenge I put out, that if we want to have sustainable development, the global average needs to be over 0 0.8 and under the two hectares per person right now. So that's basically the box within which we need to think. Uh, that doesn't mean that when we are in there, we are sustainable. It just means when we are in there, that becomes globally replicable right now. There may be additional conditions available. And so that's kind of as the offering. I believe sustainability is measure, measuring, is measurable if you want. What's missing still, and that's why instruments are important as well, is to recognize what's in our interest. Why is it in our interest to move in this direction? And that's where I would perhaps end with the, with the last metaphor, that we're still in that funny situation where most nations operate when they go to Copenhagen or now to Cancun in a way that they say, we will not fix the hole in our boat until all of you will get together and decide to fix your boat. And that seems a bit silly, because in a world of resource constraints, countries and cities that are not ready, they will essentially suffer the consequences themselves. So that's where I think, that's where the, the missing part is. There is a very strong case for self-interest that we don't see yet, <coughs> and there are tools available to see. Are you safe or not? And the more, that's perhaps the last statement, the more people really want this information to have, the more it's being used. That's why I think more important than, than forcing somebody to have a measurement is to help them see why it's important for their own well-being to have this information to make the right decisions about their own future. So let me unpack this a bit. And we're going to really try to have an active dialogue on, in each of these queries. For the benefit of everybody here, I mean, you, you said to me something interesting yesterday, which is that metrics codify beliefs. And that the world of metrics, which would seem to be a neutral territory, we can all agree on how to measure the length of this table or the size of that tree or how much water is over in that reservoir, is actually ideological. So tell us, this system versus other systems, I mean, what biases or what intentions does this system have? What's included? What's excluded? Do you manage to get to things like water and biodiversity? You, man you mentioned land. Carbon is in here. Tell, tell us, kind of unpack it a little bit further. Yeah. I would frame it slightly differently. I, again, back to the pilot analogy, that every country needs to ask themselves, what do we need to know in order to operate safely? So it's not pushing measures upon them, but it's to help them see where are they vulnerable? What do they need to know? Now, what we believe is that if you want to meaningfully talk about sustainability, you need to understand scale. 
And that's why farming is such a useful way of looking at the world, because ultimately we seem to prepare every economy in a way that they become hobby farms. But then if everybody's a hobby farm, where do we get the tomatoes and the milk from? You know, that's kind of the, the, the conundrum we're in. So the footprint doesn't measure everything. It just sets kind of the, sets the overall context of saying, how big is the planet? How much of the planet is necessary to support me? And so, of course, it includes everything, not how well we maintain biodiversity, but in a world of overshoot, that's why WWF uses the footprint very extensively. Actually, it's the first conservation organization that has taken on overshoot and the footprint, saying if we don't reduce human demand, if we, pr if we preserve one area of the planet, but without reducing human demand, we just put more demand on the rest. So it's a necessary condition to stay within the means of one planet if you want to have a chance to have a stable economy on this planet. Jacob, let's go to you because I think it's useful to get the NGO perspective before we start talking a little bit more of the business perspective. And you've operated on the international stage on behalf of NRDC, the Biogems work and other work that you've done. Um, as you look at where we are today, what is the current state? How would you rate the international community's capacity and effectiveness when it comes to establishing metrics, measuring, monitoring uh, on all different measures of sustainability? Okay, great. Big question. It, it is a big question. And uh, really, thank you all for coming today. It's really wonderful uh, to be here. Uh, I apologize for the Darth Vader voice. Uh, just before I came, I uh, saw the movie Inception, so I want to take you all to sort of a different level of the dream today and to really talk about, you know, sort of the capacity of our international community to really manage and protect and preserve uh, this planet. Um, how many of you have heard of the concept of terraforming? Okay. Uh, basically, it, this started off as a science fiction concept, it, but at one point NASA actually put some money into it, which is doing research on how you could actually take the planet Mars or maybe some other nearby planet and actually change the environment so that it would be habitable for human beings. So that maybe two or three hundred years from now, if we haven't succeeded uh, through a, maybe the 50th or 60th Aspen Environmental Forum, figure out how to solve these problems, we decide to take a small number of us to, a, to another planet and start all over again, uh, we'd be prepared. Uh, I think NASA's dropped that uh, idea, but I think it's useful and to think about what, if, as human beings, if we went to another planet, what would we take with us? Uh, and if we were really concerned about planetary management, one thing we wouldn't take with us is the concept of national sovereignty. Uh, the reality is about 350 years ago, we decided to give groups of people complete, total, absolute control over small parts of the planet. They call, we call them nation states. There are now 192 of them. They have complete control about what goes on within their own territory. Uh, and as a result, you can't, it's very, very difficult to manage commons, uh, such as the oceans and Antarctica, which are sort of under nobody's jurisdiction. And it becomes almost impossible to deal with problems like climate change and loss of biodiversity when you actually have to get absolute 100% consensus amongst 192 countries. I said to my colleagues before Copenhagen last fall, you think it's so tough to get 60 votes in the Senate, try the United Nations negotiations. That's the world we're living in. That's the basic structure of, of, the, of the world uh, organizing structure today, which has been more complicated by the, by the phenomenon of globalization, which I'll talk about in a sec in second. <laughs> The, quite, the, the discussion we're having at the, this meeting about sustainability really started almost 40 years ago, really, in, in talking about sort of the conflict between the desire for increased economic development, at the same time protecting and preserving natural resources and the environment. Uh, there was a major effort to try and reconcile those two ideas, uh, and that came out and was embodied in the notion of sustainable development, which started reaching currency about 20 years ago. And then we had the Earth Summit in 1992, uh, which some of you may remember, which is sort of a high point of kind of global concern about the environment. At that point, it was the largest gathering of presidents and prime ministers uh, in history. Uh, they all pledged to protect the Earth. Uh, they all signed on to Agenda 21, which is a 450-page uh, uh, blueprint for sustainable development. It has 4,500 4, 4, separate uh, uh, recommendations in it. 
Uh, and, you know, and the idea of your summit was that everybody, each nation was going to go home and create their own national level uh, programs for sustainable development, and we'd solve all our problems. And a lot of people looking back, that conference had a major impact. There were about 115 countries that went through an ex exercise of defining sustainable development <coughs> for their own nation and developing their own, their own agendas. Uh, thousands of communities around the world started their own Agenda 21s. Uh, a lot of people see the, the Earth Summit in 1992 as the first place that companies started really starting to think about sort of what people call triple bottom line of looking not only at uh, economic benefits but also the social and environmental dimensions. That meeting had a huge impact and one of the things I got very interested in is, okay, how do you actually measure progress now that everyone has made these commitments? And a lot of people said, well, you know, we have to, we have to develop a set of metrics so you can determine whether or not the planet is moving towards sustainability. And I sort of said, well, wait a minute, that sounds great, except, you know, if we're on an unsustainable path, um, you actually have to do something first before you then can make improvements. And what really motivated me was that I went to a UN meeting to talk about the implementation of the section of, the, of Agenda 21 on toxics. And I sat there for three hours and I listened to diplomats and scientific experts talk about toxic chemicals never mentioning the name of a single toxic chemical, a, symbol, a single country, or a single uh, chemical. And so I came to the conclusion that, you know, you could end up talking about abstractions, but if we were really going to do something, we had to be very, very concrete. And so we decided to focus on what we called a series of action indicators of really looking and saying to governments and really creating a metric which was very immediate, which was focused on an action, and then later on we could worry about a result. So, for example, in the toxics area, we went around and we, we went through a, an exercise where we asked a group of experts, what's the most important thing that every country in the world must and can do about uh, toxics? And it turns out it was lead and gasoline. Uh, and in 1994, uh, it turned out that there were two, that actually that Colombia and Brazil had actually phased out lead and gasoline in advance of the United States. And it was a perfect issue because it wasn't one that kind of cut across, cut across the north-south divide and it turned out that, in fact, some countries in the South had already taken action on it. And so we began a process of, of encouraging countries around the world to actually take steps to phase out lead and gasoline. In about 10 years, we got 100 countries to do so. What's interesting, one of the few countries in the world that still uses lead and gasoline in large quantities is Venezuela. Mm -hmm. and so you can figure that one out. But it's kind of, it's an interesting, but as a general matter, it's almost been eliminated. And that was, that was as a result of not a treaty, not a big international uh, conference, but, but the, what I saw, the power of net, networking with international agencies, concerned countries. We worked very closely with a number of the major car manufacturers, a number of the major oil companies, and country by country got it phased out. And so NRDC went through a process uh, of really trying to measure what impact that Earth Summit had in terms of actual policies and programs in various countries, and we were actually quite amazed. I mean, it the meeting had a big impact. It really got a lot of countries starting to think about what sustainability meant in their own context, and it even had a bigger impact in many, in many cities. Uh, and my theory was, you know, at that time, people only thought of international meetings involving nations. That's what the word international means. But in the 90s, it became quite clear that if you're really going to make progress on these issues, that you just couldn't engage countries. You also had to engage corporations and communities, governments at all levels, and ultimately had to engage citizens. And so the world model that was operating in 1992 was one basically where nation states had responsibilities, but by the mid-90s and late 90s, it became quite clear that we had to have sort of networks, more informal networks of various stakeholders working on problems. Fast forward to 2002, the Johannesburg Summit, on, on sustainable development and what was the real breakthrough at that summit, uh, which was basically very much promoted by the United States, was this notion of formalizing this concept of ne networks through partnerships and initiatives. And for the first time in history, the United Nations recognized only, not only commitments that were made by governments, but also commitments that were made by uh, self-organized groups of, of, of countries, international agencies, corporations, and non-governmental groups. And there were about a 250 of them. Uh, recognized in Johannesburg. Uh, Bill Clinton had the same idea. Many of you are familiar with the Clinton Global Initiative. It's the same notion of rather than waiting for grand global plans for, for, for groups to get together and actually start working on problems. 
all this leads to, I think, uh, really how do you deal with a world now in which you have many, many actors and you have literally thousands and thousands of commitments that are being made in these different arenas, commitments that are being made at the national level, uh, by nation states such as were made in Copenhagen by many individual countries, uh, commitments that are made by individual corporations, groups of corporations, uh, by individual citizens. And so I think, and, and so the real, real question I have, and I don't have an answer, is how do we create measure, measure success in this, what I call this internet world, this globalized world, where you have many, many actors that are making promises, and how do you actually hold them accountable so that we can get some sense that we are really going to make progress in moving forward towards a sustainable future? So I'll leave you with that big question, which we can turn to later. Thank you, Jacob. Thank so you. what, just to put a finer point on it, how would you grade the global community's uh, progress since 1992, since the Rio summit. I mean, have we gotten better? Are we the same? Are we worse when it comes to understanding the, the entire global community's impact and capacity to the, its biocapacity? You know, I, I, I guess I think I've seen huge progress. I mean, I started doing this work in the mid 70s. And so, I mean, we've just, we've made huge progress in, in the level of global awareness and understanding of, of, of environmental problems. We have tools available to us today in terms of technology that really allows us to see what we're doing to the planet. We have uh, the ability to communicate and organize uh, with people in a way that just wasn't possible uh, 30 years ago. I remember the first time I uh, was calling a, a university professor, this was in the 70s, in South Africa. And I had a doll phone, and I was like, wanted to get him engaged in one of our issues. And I was like, concerned that I'd make a mistake because it was so expensive to make an international <laughs> call. And then I called up and said, This is Jacob Sharon, attorney from the Natural Resources Defense Council in Washington, D.C. And the, 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 the professor's wife answered the phone. She started screaming because it sounded like somebody from some spy agency in the United States was calling. So the world has fundamentally changed. So I think, you know, we have all the tools. I think the, the, the and the key is, I think understanding the fact that, that you know, we live, you know, we often, we often talk about the virtual world. The real world really looks like that. I mean, power is really, really dispersed. And I think that, you know, I, so I'm really excited because if someone said, you know, the future is here and you can predict the future because it's here now, it's just really unevenly distributed. And so I look around and you can just go take a look at the vault. I mean, there's so many exciting things that are going on in various countries and communities and corporations, that gives me really great hope. And the question is, how can we accelerate that change? And that's why I'm so excited about this Earth Summit that's going to occur in 2012. And you know, we really want to make it the first truly global summit. And our goal is to really try and get a billion commitments to get everybody to understand that they're part of the problem as individuals. In other words, we all have individual footprints. And to kind of break out of the way that we've been thinking about the world, because we're still stuck with the nation state model, but it doesn't work. So I'm hopeful because I do see movement beyond that, and I think there's a lot of exciting things going on. Will it? So let me, let me yeah, jump in right. for one second, and then we're going to go to the more of the business context. I, let me play devil's advocate. Uh, sure. Matza says, we have GDP. You turn on the news any day, you can learn how fast GDP is growing in the U.S. or Germany, the U.K., China, wherever you want. <coughs> Why don't we have simpler indicators, and one could say that's what the ecological footprint is trying to move to, so that we can quickly understand year to year, decade to get, decade, how is this country, region, the globe doing? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a business analogy. A, a person from one of the larger companies said to me, boy, I would love to be able to boil all of our sustainability work down to one number. You know, we have credit scores, right? You can get the, your credit score from this agency and you have anywhere from whatever, 400, 800. We're used to scoring a lot of different things. Is it beyond our ingenuity to be able to come up with, a, a, I mean, even not every environmental and sustainability issue, just energy and carbon? I, mean, I, I, I say this just as a devil's advocate because we've made progress for sure, and people are innovating and developing new products. But, sorry, Mike Robbins will probably tell us in a few minutes, boy, he would love more clarity in the automotive industry on where they're supposed to be going because sometimes people are imposing metrics that aren't even relevant anymore to the products they're making. So I guess I think a big topic, and I want everybody in this room 
who, and some of you work in this space, to be ready to answer this. Why haven't we made more progress in getting clear metrics around sustainability if it's been on our global agenda, the international agenda, for nearly 20 years? Well, just a real quick answer is I think partly because it's, just, it's such a broad concept, it's sort of like defining freedom or poverty or Well, we have freedom indexes. We well, have there are, oh, no, we, okay, I understand poverty that, but not indexes. Not everybody agrees. I mean, you can have endless discussion. I mean, yeah. there, there are, I mean, you know, Matis has developed indexes and has ranked individual countries. Columbia University and Yale has made an effort to rank the ecological performance of various countries. So people are doing that. But I think, it, but I think, but you know, but it, it is so complicated because you're talking not only about a series of environmental indicators, but also a series of economic indicators and a series of, of indicators in regard of human to equity, development. Social. And you, of social yeah. inequity. And I, and I, you know, and I think that, I think you know, you can, you, I think it's, an, I think the problem is you can spend so much time trying to measure the measures that you end up not taking doing measures. And I think the key is, I think that's partly it is 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 trying to. I think we want to keep our eye on the big picture, but at the same time, not lose sight on providing people very concrete things that they need to do in their own lives, in their own communities, in their own corporations to move forward. Good. Um, and we'll get into this further. Nancy, as, as the executive at CH Toome Hill who is in charge of sustainability, give us a window into your thinking about how you measure, and you've played a lot of different executive roles there. Um, but I'm particularly curious to know, in a diversified, leading engineering construction consulting company like CH Toome Hill, these are important issues. So in, in light of all the uncertainties out there, how do you approach it? Um, just one little corner of the world at a time, basically. I mean, if you think about it, our, our clients are building things. Whether they're building the Panama Canal or whether they're building the London 2012 Olympics or they're building a water or wastewater treatment plant, <coughs> they are delivering some kind of a built infrastructure project. And for them, um, for example, I think a, a good example to use is the London 2012 Olympics. When London won the Olympics, they said these were going to be the world's most sustainable games both in the way the built environment was put together and the decisions they made and in how the games were run. Um, they took an area of London that was uh, very poor, uh, very contaminated, still had old unexploded ordnance from World War II where they had just dumped things in areas and decided that was going to be, that the Olympics was going to be a regeneration excuse and that the investment was going to go into regeneration. Um, and we are assisting them by managing that program. So how do you take a concept of we want to be the world's most sustainable games and then turn that into real action when you've got 10,000 people out there building stuff? Um, the importance, I think, and the way this plays out and ties in with the other things is first, what's the clarity of your goals? What do you pick? What did they pick to, be, to mean that? For them, it meant carbon. For them, it meant water. For them, it meant waste. For them, it meant biodiversity, and then the impact they were going to have on the community. And the significant thing was the time that then went into planning. Because one of the things, and I think coming back to your just question of why don't we have one metric, is this is such an integrated problem that if you start looking at it in silos, you can make the wrong decisions. How can you measure just carbon without looking at the impact on water of the different methods you use to generate energy? Because we use an enormous amount of water to generate energy, and we use an enormous amount of energy to treat and move water. And so if you try to look at them in silos, you end up with what I unintended consequences. Because in the silo, the decision may look really smart but then when you look at how it impacts other things, so the advantage there was to have time to plan it and to really think about how you accomplish those goals. For example, I think in the outcome, we've done enormous uh, teardown of buildings and cleanup of soil. 90% of all of the material that existed at that site is being recycled into the current activities all about 80% of all the goods that are being delivered to the site for construction are through rail and water. So they improved the rail access, they improved the canal water access, they built 
concerted, uh, coordinated uh, staging facilities so that they could significantly decrease the amount of truck traffic or actual uh, traffic onto the site. So if you plan and you think about those things in advance, you can pick those metrics with clarity and then you can drive that into behavior. That then gets cascaded into every contractor on site. So every contract that's put out has metrics that each contractor has to meet, which are then measured on a monthly basis. And if there's more than a 5% variation, then that goes into a recovery plan. And so it What does that mean, a recovery, recovery plan? Recovery plan, we got a problem. This building is taking more energy or this something like that. We're using more water. How do we fix it? We're not meeting our metrics. But you have, to, you have to manage that all the way down the supply chain. You have to make them accountable, and then you have to take action if they're not meeting their goals and, and develop a recovery plan and say, okay, we got a problem. Now what do we do to solve it? Now that's not sexy policy, wonderful conversation. That's just roll up your sleeve blocking and tackling. Um, but in a way, that's really when it comes to the final analysis, that's where the work gets done. What's the old line? I don't remember Ben Franklin or somebody that everything finally degenerates to work. Um, and that's really what that is. Now the other comment I would make is I think we're seeing a lot of progress in setting some interesting information in front of people. There's a great green roads program going on through the Federal Highway Administration right now that is looking at how to set sustainability metrics and best practices for roads, from storm drainage to construction materials to construction methods. Um, there's work being done by the American Water Works Association right now on how to build water and wastewater treatment facilities in a more sustainable manner. So there's a lot of effort in the infrastructure area and a lot of these areas on construction methods, tools, and techniques. Again, I don't know to what extent you could say they will move the dial enormous percentages, but they start at almost that cottage industry level and say we're going to change the way we do our business. Um, and in a sense, that's kind of what we can control. Nancy, would, would you say that you think, I mean, you gave the example of London, but also private organizations that are working with industry to set goals. I mean, who's doing a better job, business or government, when it comes to setting metrics that are actually working to measure sustainability? Um, I think it depends. Uh, Europe is ahead of us from a governmental perspective and, and looking at these issues. My experience here in the U.S., it's definitely in the private sector. Um, because they are looking at ways to change their footprint. We don't have clarity at the government level. Um, if you're going to set metrics, you have to start with clarity about what you want to accomplish. And the difficulty is clarity courts accountability, because once you put a marker in the sand, then everybody can shoot at it. It's a lot easier to be vague. Well, vague doesn't help you measure. Um, and so in the absence of any kind of clarity at the government level, uh, most of the work we're seeing being done is either by NGOs of some sort or other who want to establish rating systems or something, and corporations who are taking specific action to be able to meet either an internal or external metric. And what about the problem, before we go back over to Mike, um, of so-called survey fatigue, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, there yeah. are a lot of companies yeah. that will say, we're, we want to measure, we're committed to improvement, but we get two dozen different surveys from different NGOs and government organizations and more, <laughs> Mike said, yeah. three, four dozen. Yeah. How do we, couldn't someone harmonize these? So, I mean, there's GRI, there's CDP, there's a dozen different things. What's your perspective I, on I that? I think it's a, it, it's a frustrating issue for a lot of major companies. I'm sitting on a panel right now with Boeing, Dow, uh, Disney, uh, a number of others, and the amount of time they spend filling out survey forms uh, is actually keeping them from doing things. They're spending more time responding to everybody's m desire to measure uh, their frustration also is that everybody takes a slightly different perspective on it. I would guess that probably 50% of what they send in is information that the measure doesn't know what to do with uh, and isn't really sophisticated enough to know how to use, and so it gets misused. 
Um, the one or just that, not used. Or not used. Uh, the one that, that I've heard most people talk about, um, I think Newsweek did a survey about a year or so ago that nobody quite understood where it came from, where the ratings came from, how it, how it came out. And so I think you see a lot of frustration. Um, one of the things I'm seeing a, a quiet movement towards right now is whether parts of, of corporate life can kind of come up with, if you're going to evaluate us, these are the things we think you should be asking. Uh, so that there could be one more better standard way and let us spend less time reporting and more time changing. Great. Mike Robinson, from the automotive sector perspective, you've had ample opportunity to deal with questions of standards and metrics and um, give us some insight into that from CAFE to California to where you're going now. Uh, in terms of trying to come up with metrics that will really reflect where the automotive industry is going as you diversify beyond the, the traditional petroleum-based internal combustion engine. Sure. Um, it's an interesting proposition for us because, um, uh, as, as you've heard from several of the panelists now, um, we live in a, in a world of some ambiguity. Um, uh, to, to do a policy job, you've got to be able to think um, a little differently than the, than the average engineer that you're working with if you're not an engineer, and, and, and get around the abstract. And in the world I work in, um, uh, taking the abstract and translating it into something that's actionable is critical. Um, we got our arms around this uh, following the 1992 activity, uh, which led to um, a lot of discussion about how to best uh, manage our, our business in this, in this uh, context. And we literally created a separate strategy board to deal with environmental and energy issues. We call it the Environmental and Energy Strategy Board. And it had the top leadership of the company represented at the table. And one of the reasons we did that, and it was, I think, an informed um, way of approaching um, the, the very complex issues that we're dealing with globally, not just the United States, was to make sure we didn't do one thing at the expense of something else at the expense of something else, so, you know, referencing um, something Nancy mentioned. We also realized um, the truth in, in what one of the panelists this morning said when, when I think it was the evangelical that was talking, and, and, he, and I, I apologize, I can't remember his name, said something to the effect that, uh, you know, vision without a strategy is just a delusion. And, you know, that's true in the context of business. You have to not only have a vision about where you want to go, but you have to have specific strategies and then tactics to, to deliver against um, those strategies. In our case, again, it, it literally resulted in a monthly meeting of a strategy board that reviewed from an environmental and energy context what our goals ought to be. Um, we also realized, by the way, we couldn't wait for the government to, to illuminate um, what our goals ought to be. Um, and that's not a cynical view of the world. It's a realistic, I think, view of the world that if we were going to make progress in our own operations, which is the only thing we can really directly control, we had to do some things without necessarily having government um, uh, input. Um, at the same, so we've got a, a pretty comprehensive set of strategies. We measure uh, our performance against those strategies. I don't know that they're perfect strategies. I don't know that they're the optimal strategies. I know they work for us. Um, they, they allowed our manufacturing, engineering, design, R&D, everybody to be aligned around common sets of goals. So that um, I'm sure as we sit here, and if I tell you, um, if I were to, to do a quiz right now on how many of our manufacturing plants um, are landfill free as a percentage, you'd never get the answer right because we've just done these things. But we have 69 manufacturing plants that are landfill free. That's transmission plants, metal stamping plants, and assembly plants globally. I don't know what that number would be if we didn't have specific targets and goals to reach a certain percentage of our operations by 2010, but I can tell you it would be a lot less. The same with water reduction. We've reduced water reduction 35% the last five years. Energy reduction, we've reduced 40% the last five years. Same with CO2. And these are, these are normalized data. It's not because we've reduced the number of factories or anything like that. Those things are all measured. Plant managers understand what's expected of them. Environmental uh, uh, engineers know what's expected of them. Uh, energy uh, people understand from an acquisition standpoint what's expected of them. 
That's stuff that we're doing on our own. One of the, one of the difficult things for us is trying to anticipate where, when you're dealing with engineering issues, you're dealing with product planning, you're, you want certitude, you want predictability, which quite frankly is one of the reasons that, um, you know, with, with groups like NRDC, we reached out to the government about two years ago and said, look, there's got to be a better way to fuel economy than this patchwork of stuff that keeps getting thrown at us that we can't manage around, <clears throat> which led to essentially a, a collaborative effort to reach a single national fuel economy standard that takes us through 2016. Why is that important? Because it's a different model than has ever been applied before. I give a great credit to the, to the NRDCs of the world that understood the value in that proposition and others that we're collaborating on to say that, you know, together we can do more than if we fight uh, for the perfect solution that we would prefer to have uh, without that collaboration. One of the frustrating things for all of us is uh, how many people would have guessed, you know, five years ago that you'd have GM and the NRDC and the Nature Conservancy and Shell and Duke Energy and a bunch of other NGOs sitting at the table coming up with a blueprint for action for, for, for basically cap and trade for, for climate legislation that we could all buy into to have the politicians say, eh, not so much. It just, it, it's just very frustrating because we all understand that until you, make, until you make carbon a fact of life that has to be considered across the board, Dealing with fuel economy or dealing with, with piecemeal legislation is not going to get us to the, to the promised land as far as realizing the 2050 vision of an 80% reduction. If that's the goal, we know, and, and our models aren't going to be any different than CARB's models or NRDC's models, there have to be multiple pathways to get you there. And, and quite frankly, and you have to have benchmarks along the way. I mean, to, Jacob made so this point that if exactly. you, I mean, it's the, it's the, uh, the old trick of politicians to say, we'll set a goal for 2050, by which time they will be six feet underground uh, and have zero accountability. And they'll be all out of office in three to four years anyway. Mike, one thing, you're talking about the U.S. context, but GM, what most people don't know is that GM is a global company that today is actually seeing more growth in China than almost anywhere. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, automotive company in China and a major market for the company. So how, do you, how are you dealing with the global context of measurement and carbon issues, et cetera? It's, it's, uh, it's, a, really, it's a really complex question. And, and in the context of, of, of what Matt has laid out for us, um, consider this. It's not a, it's not a, uh, a static uh, pie right now in terms of, of where things are. Growth in China is incredible. I was telling my fellow panelists, in 2000, we had made an investment in China. We saw the potential. Um, we saw where personal mobility was going to go once that economy was unleashed. We sold 50,000 vehicles in China in the year 2000. This year, we're going to sell probably uh, two and a half, 2.4 million vehicles in China. And that is the tip of the iceberg in that economy. That's a very small fraction. Of the, of the population that's been mobilized, as much economic growth as there has been. And when you look at the demographics and the projections, it's unbelievable. Uh, there was an allusion made by one of the panelists this morning to the number of cities in China today that have a population of a million people. That migration and expansion of, of, of urban populations is just going to continue to grow um, almost geometrically over the next 20 years. So. That presents not only resource questions, it presents all kinds of societal questions about quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, we want to be part of that discussion. We, we have a very active um, public policy team in China, Chinese nationals primarily, that, that are engaged uh, with the Chinese government to try to understand what the plan looks like. I will have to say um, that when you're not complicated by things like due process, um, <laughs> planning is a lot clearer. And I, you know, I mean, I'm Tom, a, Tom Friedman likes to I, say it would be fun to be China for a day. For a day. Yeah. If, yeah. If, if, you know, it's sort of like without all that other stuff, it, it's, it's, it's much more efficient in, in some respects. Yes. I, I will say my impression of the Chinese is that they're very engaged with what's going on in Europe. They're very engaged with what's going on in the U.S., not just from an environmental and energy standpoint, safety standpoint as well. Um, I do wonder sometimes how they could be worried about 
you know, putting airbags in cars when people are, you know, taking their lives in their hands when they walk across the street in Shanghai. But I, you know, they are moving very, very fast from a regulatory standpoint. In fact, um, in some respects, have, have caught up and in, in are surpassing us uh, from that standpoint. I know they're, they're really looking hard at electrification. We want to be part of, uh, of the plans there. Um, you know, part of their bias might be they're sitting on a lot of coal, and, uh, you know, that tends to, to, to promote a particular activity. But the fact of the matter is they're going to probably have more electric vehicles in China faster than we are in the United States. That would be my guess. You heard it here. Uh, I want to get you all starting to think about questions and comments you'd like to, to add to the dialogue. But, Matis, let me go back to you because the premise we've been speaking about here is that essentially we can drive change and transformation by measurement, which, is, which means that if we get information in the right hands, uh, people will act. Um, it, should we believe that? I mean, should we, you know, assume that if elegant – charts like this are made and shown to the world that the people of the United States and the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait and Denmark and Australia will feel so guilty that they're over their bio capacity that they will do something? Or should we assume that uh, you and others will continue to do these good works and, you know, be fighting uphill to get action? I mean, how, how much can we really rely on information without real hard consequences if people fall behind or underneath the benchmarks that we want to set. Yeah, I information makes hardly any impact on its own. It has to be relevant information. People have to want to have this information. That's also why we, when we work with, with corporations, we'd rather work closed door rather than on the GRI report because if it's closed door, they really want to know what they need to know. If it's just a nice number on the report, the CEO will never read that number. So. Just as an example, how to make information relevant, Ecuador had about five times more biocapacity than footprint when I was born. I was born in 62. Five times more farm than it took to support the Ecuadorian population. Today, they're in a situation where they're about using as much as what they have available. So there's a huge kind of <coughs> closing of the gap. And it has consequences, physical consequences of protests from indigenous people, conflict over water rights, etc. So when they saw this graph for the first time, senior officials, they said, don't we have the right to develop? And we said, clearly, that's why we're here. We believe in the right to develop, but why are you pursuing the right to collapse? So that was a bit shocking for them, but then they saw, wow, we're actually not serving our own self-interest. And they now have a national goal. They have as a national goal to reverse their ecological deficit, and they announced it a month before Copenhagen, <coughs> independent of Copenhagen. Copenhagen would have told them, don't do anything, you're not wealthy enough. You know? But actually they saw there's a self-interest point of view. And so the point is not how can we synthesize all the information in one piece of information. The point is to say, for a pilot, what do you need to know in order to operate your plane safely? And so if it's reduced, if say, I can only read one dial, perhaps the pilot is not fit to fly the, the, the plane. So you need to know, do I have enough information to operate safely? And in the 20th century, knowing how much fuel was in your tank as the figurative airplane wasn't that important because there was plenty of fuel around. Today, we're in a critical phase of the flight where f understanding the resource constraints of your country is becoming ever more critical if you want to operate. Otherwise, we all develop into Hades, essentially. That's, that's kind of our unconscious plan. So, so the question is not what's the ideal measurement, but the question to every person, back to the self-interest. What do you need to know to operate your plane, be it a corporation, be it a city, be it a nation, safely? I would I would echo what what, he, what he's saying. I from the standpoint of self interest, um, you know, one of the things that that helped make uh, the strategy setting um, more sellable, if you will, was the fact that this stuff pays for itself if you do it right. You save not only save uh, money, but you you know you accomplish some other objectives along the way. We we've had great success in China with supplier base. Um, uh, through an organization, it's not a, it's not a GM uh, aligned organization, but, but basically it's an NGO that we've used over there to help educate our supplier base. We don't have to convince anybody to do this anymore as a pull for it. It's one of the happiest checks I write every year to, to, to basically uh, make our, our, our membership contribution to this NGO because 
there's a business pull for this. It makes sense, and it's it's aligning our supplier base in China with uh, with our, env our environmental principles. So, um, I think informed self-interest is a good thing. I'm not going to go I'm not going to go the Gordon Gecko route, but I I do think that you know informed self-interest is a good thing. And uh, but aren't aren't there areas? I mean, Montes started out with this that that countries need to see that it's in their self-interest to measure and to improve. Yeah. But there are areas that aren't so obvious, that have much longer correlations. So to use your pilot analogy, if there's one indicator that says, you know, you're descending and you're going to crash, you're going to do something about that. But if there's another one that says uh, somewhere off in the distance, and this might be, you know, not, well, it could be carbon, could be biodiversity, could be things that we don't immediately associate with harm. It's a real problem. And, and, and so then... To where do we turn to get people to actually say, look, the metrics on this, the measurement is dangerous, but we're not going to feel immediate consequences for 50, 75, 100 years. I, I think there's a misconception that we think sustainable is very far away. And that's like when Bronklin said, sustainability is about the next generation. That was 25 years ago. We are the generation. So, it, so it's actually much shorter time frames than we believe. We have public policy issues that far exceed the time frame of sustainability. For example, education. I have a nine-year-old son. By the time he is marginally productive with his first internship at 25, you know, probably society and me together have spent half a million dollars on him. That's a very bad investment, you would think. So long term, why would you do that? Why don't we just close all primary schools today because we won't see an impact for the next 20 years? And we don't. So, so there are many policy domains where we think much, much, much further than sustainability, where we will see crunches much, much earlier. So it's a misconception, I think, much more than a, a, a priority of different timescales. Well, it's, there clearly must be a huge misperception because if you look at even polling since the beginning of the economic crisis, environmental issues, particularly climate, have been declining in public concern, in this country at least, which is concerning, to say the least. Let me see if we have some questions from the group. We have about 15 minutes. Um, and if you would just let me let us know the, your name and the name of any affiliate organization. So we'll start right here. Hi, my name is Jamie Ponce. I'm a management consultant with AC Farm. And I appreciated Jacob's recap of the of Agenda 21 coming out of the Rio Verde Summit, especially the observation that even these great guidelines can become terribly abstract without concrete examples like taking lead out of gasoline. So in that spirit, I'm wondering if the panelists could share a particularly powerful or innovative ecological, environmental, sustainability metric and the specific goal that that metric was designed to address, either, either metrics that you've developed in your companies or, in, or organizations or clients. Oh. Can I start? Yeah, I, one that NRDC I was involved in was the whole creation of the LEED system, uh, measuring uh, uh, the environmental characteristics of buildings. And it's an interesting one because it was a colleague, Rob Watson, who actually was one of the uh, individuals who was very involved in setting up our work in China. And he said, you know, we really should sit down with uh, architects and builders and the business community and come up with a set of standards, a set of <laughs> metrics, and a rating system. And all the lawyers at NRDC said, "You're crazy. You know, we got we have to get we have to have government regulations and and you know accountability." And you know, Rob persevered. And I think you know, if you look at the impact that LEED has had, it's been amazing. And what and in a sense, it, it sort of it was an effort to kind of go ahead and create a standard amongst the players, amongst the people that really knew a particular sector. And then over time, it's been adopted widely, uh, voluntarily by by companies and builders around the world, but also it's been, been, been incorporated into more formal standards. And I think that's a really kind of great example of, of, you know, of creating a standard over time, which has had some real impact. And I subscribe to that. We've got, we've got the only building of it's a manufacturing facility in Michigan. It's LEED certified. It's the only building, only manufacturing facility of its type, the, the Grand, uh, Lansing Grand River. And it's uh, it builds it builds family vehicles, and yet it's it's got the gold standard uh, within the Leeds program. That was a meaningful standard for us, and when we aspire to have more plants like that, I would tell you from my standpoint, I was there at the birth of, you know, getting rid of R12 Freon, and and that was a standard that came out of these types of discussions, or or a goal that came out of these types of discussions through the, the 
various uh, international activities going back to the Montreal Protocol. We, we, we worked our way into something called 134A to reduce the, the ozone impact of, uh, of R12 and, and get that out of the lexicon. We announced last week we're going, to, we're going across the board to an alternative refrigerant that's not going to have any ozone impact at all, basically. I mean, it's going to basically take it out of the equation, mm -hmm. which is a huge step forward. And it's basically um, 90, it's like the old ivory soap commercials, 99 and 47th, 100th percent okay or, or pure. Well, that's basically um, what this 1234YF is going to do. We're not going to have it available because it's a new it's a new product, but um, it gave us it gave us an insight in terms of you know where we ought to be headed. Uh, I hope the rest of the, the car manufacturers follow us in that direction. I suspect some will and some might not, but it basically takes re car refrigerant out of the equation from an ozone impact standpoint. And what little ozone impact there is dissipates within 11 days. Nancy, or Nothing. do you want to add anything? I mean, one interesting note about LEED, and it's interesting it didn't come up earlier, it's a private standard that was developed by the industry with Rob's real guidance and NRDC's kind of important role as an incubator and partner. And if I can say, because I've been involved in a lot of green building projects, it's a standard that's imperfect, mm -hmm. and the U.S. Green Building Council knows it mm -hmm. and has made real efforts to improve it over time. So we're now on version 3.0, and there are all different lead permutations. There's new construction, there's existing buildings, there's corn shell, there's neighborhood development. And this is an interesting model because it goes to Nancy's, you know, the point I was asking about, about government versus private sector, who can move quickly, who can be nimble, who can get buy-in. And lead has grown, even though it was a U.S. standard, to become adopted globally. Yeah. And okay, I, but, yeah. There is now actually work going on at Harvard um, to try to come up with a, a similar LEED certification for infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, which I think would be something very interesting to watch. And I think the important thing that you just alluded to is we don't have time to wait for perfect. Right. Um, this is this is the old adage of not letting you know perfect be the end of <coughs> good enough. Right. Um, just get out there and make it better, and then right. keep refining. But let's and let's use what we yeah. have to inspire. Like you say, inspired yeah. infrastructure. My colleague Joel McCow is working on a company standard really that's going to be based on almost like a lead ranking, where you you know you can be get you can get certified or silver, or gold, or platinum. And he's working on that with UL, which has right. a long history right. of doing right. oh, certifications. Let, let's get more questions. Yes, this woman right here. Um, there's a, my name is Lara Louise, and I'm an architect in Chicago, and I'm also a lead accredited professional. Um, I'd like to ask also about LEED, the, the benchmarking tool. In, in the industry of the AEC, or architecture, engineering, and construction, we've adopted, you know, majority of us have embraced LEED. However, one thing we're experiencing right now, there's a caveat to this one, in, in that most people now, or even companies or clients, have adopted a greenwash um, method, as if you know, they, they're, they're flanking lead as almost like a marketing tool, which defeats sometimes the purpose of it. Like say, for example, they're a, a carpet company would say, oh, we're, we're um, you know, we're lead credit or we're lead um, compliant. So you could get points. So it's all about uh, getting in the points, but really not necessarily producing high-performance buildings or contributing to the efficiency of the performance of the building. What strategies would you recommend to mitigate or to, to minimize these greenwashing that's occurring? Hmm. Right now? Thoughts? Well, I think the bottom line is if they're getting credit for something yeah. they're not really doing, there's something wrong with the measurement system. Um, I mean, you want people to be incentivized. And so it's a good thing, in my mind, that they want to be able to take that value and create something, some economic value from it. But if they're not really doing it, uh, then there's something intrinsically wrong with the way the measurement system's working. Yeah. I, mean, I think another way of framing this, if I could, is that we shouldn't get confused between metrics and excellence. Yes. And you know, another domain in which this I've seen this occur is Energy Star. There are certain Energy Star categories in which it's very easy to get Energy Star qualified, and then you realize you have an Energy Star qualified product that isn't that energy efficient. And so, if I, if I can extrapolate from the question, and maybe it goes back to the fundamental question we asked at the beginning: was why are we measuring? What are we measuring? And let's not let measurement become 
There's a reason. There's a reason. Itself. There's a reason the FTC is is this year probably going to be coming out with a lot of green advertising rules because they understand uh, the uh, li the liberties uh, some people have taken with those with those kinds of claims. They might like technically they might it's technically qual like the they might technically stuff. qualify at some level for some certification, but they. They've kind of implied other other things associated with those claims, and it's a it's a fair observation. I think uh, we're all afraid of that because we don't want to we don't want to have this um, this activity trivialized or or turned into a marketing scheme. And, and on a sort of more abstract level, it's really trying to balance on the one hand, really encouraging people to act, uh, and then on the other hand, to provide accountability. And you know, if you think about the sort of the international intergovernmental world. It's all about sort of making very, very big pro promises and a lot of talk about accountability and then almost no action. The internet world is all about action and almost zero accountability. You don't even have to reveal who you are. And I think, in this, in the, and that's the real challenge we have. In other words, we need to get everyone acting, but it's a problem because when people act, a lot of you know, people's motives may be good and they may not perform as high as they'd like and they go ahead and sort of overstate what they've done. But is it better than then not acting at all? But at the same time, you, you worry about, you know, how do you provide the credibility for the system? And then ultimately, we need government. You know, we need, you know, I think it's quite clear we work with GM because we know that if we're really going to make a transition to a low carbon, green economy in the United States, you got to have a price on carbon. And so at the end of the day, you got to have government engaged. And, but, 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 but at the same time, I think, you know, you want to you create an environment where people are really, really encouraged to act. And, and not have to worry about answering a thousand surveys and forms. So it's a, providing that balance is critical. Or should we uh, quickly because we want to give a lot of questions? Yeah, let's get 10 more questions. Okay, um, let's go to this gentleman right here. This has been great, and I think that uh, uh, the work that Matthias has done here to sort of simplify uh, sustainability is really helpful. But I also uh, agree with Jacob that it's more complex than this. Um, you know, this is a step forward, but there are still uh, things that we, we don't know uh, what to measure and how to measure them in terms of uh, social norm shifts. Uh, I'm reminded in particular of Einstein's comment that not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So we're still, we have to keep in mind there's still this gray cloud over all of this that we really don't know um, the most uh, uh, important things to measure, especially in complex adaptive systems. Um, Jacob pointed out that you know it's the ability of networks to adapt and come up with different solutions at different paces, and I'd add in different cultures at, at the same time. Um, that's really important. So uh, there are things that are there are there are problems here that are puzzles, and we can measure those. But there are also problems that are mysteries, where we have no idea what's going on. Yet nature has a way of finding uh, solutions, and the best examples are in the emergence of networks and self-organizing networks in nature. For instance, ants. We don't really know how they do what they do, but there's plenty of evidence that they, they self-organize to do things, including lifting and moving things that are way greater than their weight, things that just shouldn't be possible to do. We're seeing it in networks, the internet's proving it most, telecommunications networks, but we're learning about how that, uh, how, how word spreads, how ideas move. Uh, but they don't we, we always- Just give us a question to finish off great observations, but right. we wanna make sure everybody gets a chance to contribute. Here's the, here's the question. So we, we know this much, and we've created systems in the past that are, that are uh, not perfect, uh, and then we adapt to them as if they're a satisfactory norm. You just pointed this out in terms of the excellence question. You know, we, this session is called yardsticks for success. Well, why is it yardsticks instead of metric sticks? Or what about AC and DC? You know how that happened? <coughs> I won't go into it, but there are problems that we have adapted to and we've learned to live with, and um, it's, uh, uh, it's, the, it's time to force up to the unfortunate equilibriums that we all uh, have adopted here, including around carbon, and that, you know, to keep manufacturing. I'm going to just ask, we've we got to get some other questions, and thank you for the observations. What do we, what do we measure? Right. Uh, Not everything is measurable. That's part of, I think, okay. what you're saying. And, and, but what are the hardest things that we can measure? It's a good, good point. Good rhetorical question to leave. Let me see if we can get three or four more perspectives. We only have two minutes. Um, Shelley, and then this gentleman, and right here. Go ahead. Um, my question we'll get you is two. more about goals. Um, I work for a Fortune 
Fortune 500 company for many, many years, and it was difficult to even determine what to measure. And you know, and we started with sort of the simple things like energy footprint. And, you know, and, it, and even though it wasn't easy to get all of the information, that's where we started. But once we had all the data, the question was, how do we set the goal? And there was a whole lot of discussion of, do we think that this is doable? Which, in my perspective, that wasn't good enough. That's incrementalism. Right. You know, if you only set a goal that you know you can get to <laughs> next year, well, have you really pushed the envelope? But otherwise, what criteria would you recommend for those of us in, in private business? How do we set goals that we know are really going to push the envelope with those things that are measurable, like energy and water and waste? But, you know, how some of the goals that you hear from companies seem so arbitrary. You know, 25% by 2012. How do they get there? Mm -hmm. Good question. I don't. I don't know that there's really an answer to the question. I. I think it really depends upon how aspirational you choose to be, and how much you want to. Well, frankly, how much market value do you see in it? I mean, let's be really realistic here. You know, Starbucks has now, I think, set a goal that within like three years, um, everything is going to be recycled. They're not their cups, everything, and they're going to ensure that everything is. Well, that's a really aspirational goal. Uh, they must believe there is some market value in trying to figure out an answer to something that most people would say, that's going to be really hard. I don't know how you get people to do that. Um, you look at what at the projections that Walmart probably made a few years ago about what they want to do. They're very open about the fact that they had a lot of problems and they needed to find a place where they could look good and so they went after environmental and supply chain and they have they have made a profound impact on enormous industries in the way packaging is done and the way stores are used just beyond what anybody thought very aspirational goal they clearly thought there was some market value in doing that um, in fact if I could say yeah I heard Lee Scott a few months ago right. say when they set their goals and it's an interesting uh, case they actually said they wanted to be powered a hundred percent 100 percent by renewable energy yeah. but the question people had was by when Right. Within two years, five years, or a hundred right. years. Right. And so, I mean, one way of framing this is you want goals to be appropriate to the right. task, as Nancy's saying. He said in this speech, I particularly, I uh, specifically wanted to set a goal that was unreachable. Yeah. Because I wanted to inspire people. And then they came back a year later yeah. and they set very specific goals, benchmarks along the way. But sometimes goal setting is about alignment and rallying the troops. Yeah. Sometimes it's about being ready for the next GRI report. Sometimes, you know, goal setting has to be appropriate to the task. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a leadership question as much as anything in what you want to accomplish in the outcome. Any other thoughts on that? I, I, I think it does have to be specific to the industry you're in, the position you're in within that industry, your history. Um, and it's got to be meaningful to the business operations you're working with. You, you can't have the policy uh, strategies uh, deemed as some kind of pie in the sky, non-related to the real business objectives. Uh, Speaking of which, I'm, I'll bet people here want to know, so I'll ask you. <laughs> is there anything different in the new GM since the bankruptcy a year ago when it comes to this goal setting and metrics versus the old GM? Actually, um, there's a lot different in our business, a lot different. and. Um, um, one of the things that I'm thrilled about is the clarity around which we've, we've got our models, uh, our portfolio organized in terms of what, what our vision looks like for the next uh, six to ten years. Um, but within the, the framework that I described earlier in terms of you know, environmental strategy, energy strategy, one of the carryovers was, was that strategy board. And, and not just carryover in terms of the type of organization, but as much as possible carryover in terms of the members. because. They get it, they're true believers, they understand the history, and they could carry forward a context that made sense. Great, so here's what we're gonna do. We have really no time left, but I'm gonna let each of you, the three of you ask your questions, and then we'll see who might have quick answers, and if they don't have quick answers, you can come up afterward and bug them. So go ahead, just tell us your qu question in 10 seconds. Well, this has something to do with the corporate accountability and how everyone in the corporate world has
pass this over to the plate. Um, just real quickly, some companies have started incentivizing their, exec their executives by indexing their bonuses on ecological and carbon right. goals. Good question. So, and I'm thinking about Denon in France, which is where I'm from. But that necessarily entails uh, measures that are, for now, unfortunately developed in-house. So, to what extent do you believe that a set of carbon or ecological accounting principles in a way that is similar to accounting principles will be devised to regulate potential future reporting, I mean, uh, single annual reporting on um, ecological or sustainability performance? Great. Okay. And your question is? Oh, I have a question for Mike. Um, regarding China and uh, what you were talking about, I know with their recent stimulus package, they offered um, monetary incentives for people to buy energy efficient light bulbs and other home products, especially in Western and Southwestern China. Um, do you think that they would potentially ever do that for an electric car? And if so, do you think a higher number of people driving those cars in China would somehow resonate with American consumers and with American government? They, they will and they have. They've already done it. They've, they've started to incentivize uh, basically fuel economy performance. Um, and I'm proud to say that we've got more entries than anybody. Let's uh, get the next question, then we'll see if we can answer a couple of them. Yes, quickly, please. Now, my question is actually for the whole group. And that is, how many people in this room feel that we, as a total human enterprise on Earth, are on a sustainable course? Show of hands. Now, how many people think we're not on a sustainable course? Virtually everyone. So. My point here is, and at least my question is... That's, why we're, That's why we're here. That's why we're here, Dave. My point is that there are two concepts here. There's a concept of efficiency in operations and what we do, and the other concept that I think Matis is talking about is a balancing of what are, what's our total demand versus what's available. Yep. And there are two different concepts. No question. And my question would be, is that, is that an accurate perception? And also, of uh, Jacob, I'm not sure how you would do sustainability, so I'm kind of curious. Okay, great. Okay. So, because I am in the tradition of starting on time and ending on time, I'm going to ask our panelists if in response to any of those three questions they want to add anything, each one of you, or any other final comment. Please take 30 seconds each. And then uh, if, if anyone wants to continue the dialogue, the beautiful thing about the Aspen Institute and the Aspen Environment Forum is we are all here together and you can do so in between panels. But Nancy, why don't we start with you? The only comment I would make on the, the gentleman from France is Given the different businesses that people are in, it'd be very complicated to try to come up with one metric that you could use, like an accounting metric for incentivization. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but it seems like a pretty daunting challenge. Jacob? Uh, you know, my view of, of sustainability is really it's sort of a lens at which you can look at, at particular situations in which you take into account the environmental, the economic, and the equity aspects, and that what's really critical is that you don't try to come up with a universal definition, but that you create processes where people within a community or a corporation or, or a country decide what it means for them, hopefully then setting relatively short-term measurable goals and then moving on to the, the, the job of actually moving towards a sustainable future. Uh, to, the, to the last question about the dichotomy between creating efficiencies and dealing with the larger question that uh, the Matisse has put on the table, one of the reasons that you end up with the strange bedfellows you have with GM and NRDC and other industrials and other NGOs trying to work at an overall uh, carbon uh, reduction scheme, uh, both here and elsewhere, is because of the recognition we all have that this is not a sustainable approach. If you want to hit the targets that we've, we've agreed make sense by 2050, you can't have us working on fuel economy, but not dealing with the fact that somebody that's running a two-stroke lawnmower uh, is putting as much VOC and NOx into the atmosphere as somebody that's driving 24,000 miles on an SUV in, in, in one hour's worth of use. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somebody that's running a 100 horsepower uh, uh, motorcraft, uh, watercraft, snowmobile, or you know, a snowmobile or watercraft is doing the same. It, it just doesn't make sense. You have to be you have to be accountable as a society for the total the total equation here, or you're not going to make the progress we know you need to make. Great, Matis, your final word to end us off. Yeah, no, sustainability obviously is multifaceted, but using more 
from nature that nature can regenerate inevitably will lead us to its ecological bankruptcy. Uh, and that's avoidable. So I think it's a necessary condition to stay within the means of one planet, but it's not sufficient, obviously. Where's the $100 bill? Well, what yeah, what happened yeah, to that? So Where did that go? That's, that's one of those mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a mystery. I want to thank this terrific panel. Thank everybody here for your, your attention, questions, and input. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you.